All right, we are are live for the February AMA that is Ask Me Anything session. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear all right. I'm getting things set up here on my end. As I do that, let me say a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. We've got 95 at this point, hoping for uh, getting to 100 fairly soon. Uh, they're the ones who make this, this sort of activity possible. Um, you know, carving out time from, from my day um, and supporting all the work that I do. Uh, let me get myself set up here with the uh, uh, chat thing. There's always a little bit of finagling things in YouTube. Um, there we go. So it looks like I can, I can actually see it on the uh, page where, where it's happening. And I've got a question already uh from uh somebody and it's uh do i watch dank memes so the answer to that would be no in part because i thought dank was just a way of describing memes uh i thought it was sort of a term that people used in the meme producing community for saying that they particularly <laughs> liked certain memes. I don't actually, I don't know enough about meme culture to really uh, have much to say about classification. So if I imagine there must be a video channel out there called Dank Memes or something like that. Um, so that's, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't actually watch. I too that I don't watch a lot of videos in part because I don't have the time to. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I produce a lot of video content, um, but that takes a lot of time. Each of the five, each of the half hour Hegel videos takes about, you know, between editing, putting all the, the stuff together, planning it, thinking out what I want to say, it takes about five hours for, for, for each of those. And some of the, all right, oh, there's a lot of questions already rolling in, so let me, Quit blathering about that. Um, John Fisher asks, what are your views on the ethics, euthanasia, and abortion? Do you think either of these should or continue to be legal? Um, <clears throat> so I think that, you know, I, 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 I think that um, there could be some situations in which, you know, from sort of a consequentialist perspective, it could actually make sense to... Um, say that that abortion should be the case, you know, uh, should be provided. I think that in a lot of cases, that's not actually the case. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, same thing with euthanasia, we're kind of boxed into this corner in the West where we decide everything on this very global level um, in terms of legality. And that's where a lot of these debates take place. Um, rather than, and, you know, you might say on the ground where where they be taking place and where, where you know, it's kind of hit or miss. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's probably enough of an answer. Um, can I please give a lecture on Hans Gorg Gadamer? So, uh, you know, I've got a lot of other stuff to do. I like Gadamer, but other things slated. Um, I do, you know, accept commissions for doing videos, which means that I put some of my projects on hold and uh, focus on what what somebody who's actually commissioning me uh, wants me to do. But but I don't I don't think there's any Gadamer stuff coming up anytime soon. In part because I'm so far because I need to do. Um, although you know, giving a lecture uh, that that's 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 feasible. Um, Hashir asks, what are your views on affirmative action or reservation? So I should say that reservation is, is um, another way of talking about it. As far as I know, it is mostly used in Indian contexts, um, you know, what we call set-asides, right? Um, I think that in, it's one of those things where it can be useful, but only for a certain amount of time. And the problem is is that once affirmative action um, structures are created, they tend to be not viewed as a temporary 
um, you know, fix for clear injustice and, and deprivation taken for granted as like a right, you know, uh, by, by various people. I know this is a big problem in India where um, were for a 10-year period and they've been extended and extended and extended and they probably won't go away. And we have similar things ha happening here in the United States in terms of affirmative action as well. But I also think it's important to look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't have any intrinsic objection to uh, affirmative say. Um, all right, so let me, the thing jumps around a little bit when I scroll. Uh, Richard asked advice you can give young people. So, um, that's a good one, uh, because I personally, you know, looking at, at the situation that I've grown up in, I'm, you know, now a middle-aged man generation. And I think that things are much harder for many young people in what we call here in the United States. It's the millennial generation and um, uh, generation Y and, and, you know, in part because over time, you know, the boomers really were the apex. Um, they, they access to cheap health care, to uh, cheap education, to cheap loans. Housing didn't cost that much. My generation got hit with some really difficult stuff. And I think it's even worse for the, the present generations. Um, and we could talk about, you know, all different causes for this. So there, there's some real challenges ahead that it's important to figure out what you can use so that you don't become despondent or despair. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can make it through each day. And I think philosophy can help with that. Um, I doubt that, you know, much academic philosophy is going to help particularly with that. But a lot of, you know, philosophy as a way of life, I think, can can help you uh, with with those sort of um, challenges, sort of make distinctions when, when you need to and, and engage in, you know, practical reasoning that leads to good decision making. Oh, here's a good one from Lyndon. Uh, do you feel your background in philosophy and rhetoric critical thinking arms you in any way against persuasion? salesmanship, shilling, and God philosophy, and so on. Yeah, it, it does. It also makes me, um, uh, it makes me a bad client when it comes to psychotherapy because I have a hard time going in and dealing with the average therapist who, you know, studied a few things here and there and has got a lot of practical hours and deals with people who generally want things explained to them and haven't ever, you know, read any any theory. And, you know, um, like, you know, just the other day I was actually in, in, in therapist's office and uh, he was recommending something to me and I was saying, you're getting that out of Gottman, right? I've already, you know, I, I get what you're, that's not helpful here. <laughs> You know, and so that's that makes it very tough to find someone to work with. Um, but it also, yeah, it does arm me against sales mini sort of pitches. And I'm going to take a little bit of time here and just talk about um, a bit of digression, make a bit of digression, talk about something like in the last week. So I've had, I always get pitches from everybody, like in LinkedIn and other things, people who want me to work with them, become part of their marker, join you know system or they want to provide me with business coaching and I find that much of what those people are is exactly but they've got these talking points in their head and they don't really know how to go beyond that and so you know I'll I'll hear somebody you know for example being part of a, a new streaming network and I was like that you know this is really cool for gamers how's this going to work for philosophy and the person did not have any answers at all. Instead, I got answers about like who the founders were. I even went so far as to like give a schema and say, here's how you could make an argument to me. I'm just looking for you to fill in the content. And this person could not do it because they didn't have, you know, on the one hand, they, I think they didn't have the, the information. They hadn't done their research on my channel. 
Um, and on the other hand, I think they were, had that habit of mind of just not going beyond that. I got pitched uh, on LinkedIn. Somebody LinkedIn connected with me and wanted to pitch me some coaching stuff and then backpedaled once they realized that I do coaching because, again, hadn't done their research. You know, I, I got two different pitches to belong to, uh, you know, networks for philosophers working or PhDs working outside of academia. Aces, I was like, I don't see how this is actually valuable for me. Sounds like you're doing, in effect, multi-level marketing, and you want me to be in what we call your downline. So, yeah, you know, being able to to analyze things effectively and ask the right questions really does arm you against a lot of the BS that you run into. Um, all right, so that's a long digression on that. Let me uh, answer Francis's question. Why aren't more philosophers also mystics? Um, so you got to be careful there because mystic means a lot of different things. Um, according to somebody like Bertrand Russell, you know, who totally abused the term, like many British philosophers of his era did, oh, this person's a mystic, this person's a mystic. Really, you know, in a strict speaking, uh, in a mystic unless you think that there's some sort of ineffable reality that you engage through perhaps contemplation or meditation or or through action or love or something like that and that that you know surpasses philosophy um, or you know surpasses the the realm of the comprehensible in general let's say I mean you could ask the same question why aren't more literary figures mystics why aren't more historians mystics why aren't more sociologists mystics and the answer I think is once you go the path of saying that, there's something, and it's absolutely important. It puts everything in perspective, and you just can't say anything about it. Uh, or you can, you know, maybe have some metaphors about it. You're kind of stepping outside of the game. Other philosophers can legitimately look at you and say, "Yeah, I'm not buying it." Uh, and I myself am very distrustful, in part because of personal experience of people who make appeals to, you know, mystical states or stuff like that. I'm not saying I think it's all bullshit, but I, I would say that, you know, half of the people that I've encountered that are that are talking about this sort of stuff, it is bullshit when they're talking about it. And um, so I, I'm very careful about about sort of thing. And I, I think that, you know, um, there's an argument that you can make that, that you know, the, the sort of reality like that. I mean, Plato's gesturing at that, the form of the good. You know, um, think about all, all this sort of Neoplatonic uh, on contemplation and, and reaching something beyond the just the intellect. That's all, you know, cool, but um, it's, you know, it's hard to get other people to, to buy into that, I'd say. Mm. So, I Andrew has a comment. I really appreciate your series on the worlds of speculative fiction. Always makes my day. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's actually turned out to be quite a fun thing to do. We we originally just envisioned it for a year. Um, you know, it's a for those who don't know. It's, so it's a it's a series that I do with a local library that way, which is which is west uh, out in you know the suburbs of Milwaukee and we've got a good group of people who show up um, you know engage in conversation um, sometimes all of them have read the text sometimes only some of them have try to bring you know some some useful discussion about world building philosophical themes the biography of the person uh, excuse to indulge myself in some guilty pleasure reading in science fiction fantasy um, horror, uh, cyberpunk, a couple other <clears throat> genres as well. And, um, so, so it's, it's, uh, you know, taking on a lot of life of its for it, which you can find in the reason IO Academy. I think I've got it linked to in all the videos in that series. You can click on that. It's a free class. Actually, you can sign up for it. I'm still building it out though. All right. Um, Leviathan, what is the difference between Spinoza and Hegel's understanding of determination is negation? Simply put, Spinoza's is static and Hegel's is dynamic. Um, you know, Spinoza's is, is largely, you know, abstracting away from 
history or, or stuff like that. Um, although, you know, there's room for thinking historically within a Spinozistic perspective. It's just that Spinoza, uh, you know, like Teolo uh, Tractatus Theologico Politicus and things like that, it just isn't, you know. Um, Hegel is deliberate thinking in terms of, of uh, determination as negation, but he's thinking through negation uh, in, a, in a different way and um, tying it directly to historical development. Um, so I, I'd say that's, I mean, there's a lot more to be said about that, but um, that's, uh, that's probably enough. Uh, Papa Metu, who's your favorite philosopher? That is one I can't answer. Uh, uh, because I don't I don't have a favorite philosopher at the, I have a list of people who I really like and I keep going back to over and over again. Um, I say of that every one of them, I don't get enough time to read all <laughs> all of their stuff again. Um, but I, I don't I don't actually have a favorite. I'll tell you, you know, the people that I really enjoy. Um, just sort of running through it. Of course, you know, Plato, Aristotle, when it comes to the Stoics, I really like Epictetus a lot. Although, you know, Seneca, he's, he's kind of growing on me. Really like Cicero. Um, I, I enjoy reading Augustine, um, but I probably would say I like Boethius and Anselm more. Um, but every once in a while, I find myself enjoying it, but, but, not not quite so much. Um, I really enjoy, you know, reading uh, Hume is another favorite. And these, notice these are people I tend to not agree with. Um, of course, Hegel, uh, even though Hegel is very drawn, um, I like the scope of his thought. Uh, Nietzsche, um, you know, Kierkegaard, Gabriel Marcel, big fans of them, Max Scheler. Dietrich von Hildenbrand, um, you know, Alistair McIntyre is a living philosopher who I'm a big fan of. Um, I mean, I just go on and on and on, right? And so I think that's not very helpful. So I'm going to stop. Oh, here's a great question by by Flea Bitten: Why do colleges teach Marx but not Rand? So it depends on the college, right? And and we've got to always be careful about generalizing about the American system because we're this weird patchwork of all these different colleges and universities. We're not like most countries that have a, a national system. Um, but it is true that, that you're not going to see a lot of teaching of RAND except in business departments where, where you often find a lot of people liking them. That said, I've actually known a few Randians in my time. Um, some of whom did in fact teach RAND and I've actually taught RAND in ethics classes, not as a course, but as a great representative of, of egoism. Um, but you know, the, the, the idea among a lot of academics is Rand is just terrible philosophy and look at the deplorable people that, that read her. So why would we even want to bother with that? And, and I've had some eyebrows raised when people find out that I actually did teach Rand, you know, but I teach everybody. Right, I, I I teach a broad spectrum of people, uh, very few of whom I actually am in, in anything like three quarters agreement with. Um, now, why do people teach Marx? Marx isn't actually taught that. There's a lot of references to Marx, but I don't know that many people who actually know their Marx <laughs> and teach their Marx. Um, but but you know, well, it's fair to say that the academy is much more comfortable with thought that's that's on the left than thought that's on the right. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the way it works. Um, I will say that, you know, from reports that I'm getting, Rand is starting to cast cases, interestingly enough. Um, so it's, you know, it's worth actually reading her. Uh, um, she's a terrible historian of philosophy. You know, it, it just ignore every or take with a grain of salt everything she tells you about. You know, everybody from Plato on. But you know, her thoughts are are, are interesting and they're well. You know, if you want, to, and same thing with Marx. I mean, you know, Marx. He's he's very unfair to most of 
to the people that he criticizes. Um, but he's got some, you know, some interesting thoughts that are worth taking a look at as well. Hmm. Hash, Hashir asks my views on nationalism. Um, well, there's all different kinds of nationalism. Uh, if we're talking about the sort of, you know, my nation right or wrong, I'll admit in the past I've been nostalgic for that sort of thing. You know, when I was in high school, I'll tell you a story here that, again, a bit of a digression. So when I was in high school, um, I was reading a lot of social theory and, uh, you know, I was also reading kind of widely in the history of religions and I was uh, quite frustrated by the society that I was living in. So we're talking about the 1980s. Um, I planned to go in the military, you know, um, and I was, you know, a pretty rough and tough kid in many respects. I was getting in trouble for getting in fights and, and stuff like that. And although I, I you know, just kind of coasted through, through school, <laughs> and I got put in, into AP... Um, like American combined class and the, the teacher for the history class, he was a real jerk, um, terrible guy. He had us write essays on news war, right? So predictably enough, most of the, and he, and he laid it out like, you know, we've got, you know, radical, liberal, conservative, reactionary. And so most of the girls were liberal, most of the boys were conservative. And I began my essay by saying, you know, I would say that <clears throat> I'm drawing my political part from Napoleon, uh, Benedito Mussolini, and I forget who the third person I named. Oh, from Clausewitz, yeah. And, um, you know, I proceeded to outline this, this, this thing. It was essentially sort of a, a, you know, a fascist perspective. Uh, I'm not a racist person because there's a difference between national socialism and, and, and fascism that, that we respect in fascist studies. Uh, um, or at least some of us do. And um, I was invited to get up in front of the class and read it. And the reason I was invited is so everyone could, you know, excoriate me for being such a terrible person. And then there was one guy who came up to me uh, who's, who's now a raging right winger, total reactionary. And he was like, you know, I didn't want to say anything in class, but I think you're right. And I, and I felt of revulsion towards him because I figured out very quickly that he was for what I was talking about, but for very, very different reasons. I wanted an end to class conflict. I wanted an end to, to sort of, you know, uh, struggles between nations. I had this sort of imperialistic idea that I was laying out. And keep in mind, I was 16 years old at the time. And um, so there, you know, there's different kinds of, of nationalism. And I understand some of the attractions to to that you know if his first inaugural speech he's it was essentially Bannon's speech he's outlining this sort of like we're going to get rid of all these conflicts and take care of everybody by america first right and that's a perennial lure um i think that uh it can be you know history shown us a very bad thing uh when it gets misappropriated and it almost always does get misappropriated so I'm not a big fan of nationalism anymore. You know, when I when I hear uh, new model armies, uh, you know, my, my people right or wrong, um, there's something in me, so I know that that temptation. Um, anyway, that's that's probably enough about that. Scrubby, what does Marx get right, and what is wrong? Um, that'll have to be very brief. So I'll, I'll say right now that my very favorite piece by Marx is one that most uh, Marx to, which is the uh, uh, 18th Brumaire of Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, right? Um, which is about how they sort of tracing out how something almost like fascism develops because of class conflicts not being worked through properly <laughs> and not moving towards the right thing. This line about, you know, at first things are repeated, things are repeated in history, you know, uh, I think. I forget exactly the wording, you know, first as a drama, then as a farce, right? Um, and and it's, it shows a lot of insight into those things. And I think Marx is also right about the no notion of alienation. Um, I think he got some things right. You know, the historical determinism, man, Marx just quit believing in that stuff, you know, over a century ago. 
uh, when things didn't turn out the way that they were being predicted, right? Um, so, you know, there, there, there we go. Um, all right. Uh, Canal points out that Rand didn't ever publish anything in a peer-reviewed niche. Uh, well, did he? Uh, yeah, maybe he did. Uh, but neither did neither did Marx. Uh, neither did you know most. So I I don't I don't know that that's actually uh, important. Uh, Wilhelm, have you read Stephen Hicks explaining modernism? If so, what's your take? I haven't read it, and um, I actually you know I've been hosted by the Institute for Ethics and Entrepreneurship to come down to Rockford and give talks about Stoicism. I met Hicks uh, there yet. Because uh, I always deal with my my um, former classmate and colleague Matt Flam, who's a Santayana scholar, um, cool guy. Um, but I haven't read I haven't read Hicks uh, Hicks uh, book, so I can't really say any, anything about it at this point. Um, oops, just skip through a bunch of them. Let me scroll a bit. Um, Oh, here's a good question from the Alquiora 44. How would a Stoic act if they were in the situation of the, Flo the Florida shooting? So this is, you know, the Florida shooting, and there's going to be many, many, many more of these situations uh, uh, until something changes here in America, and it's going to have to be some sort of radical change. I'll tell you, too. Again, I'll sort of open up uh, to you. I've been talking with my wife about this who's kind of my sounding board sort of crap and with um because i you know i come from a family of gun nutters uh, um people who are all about all oh, the government guns I, I grew up in rural wisconsin you know i was in the army i fired weapons um i i, I understand you know, you know all they owe buddy nobody in the united states <clears throat> should have an assault weapon i don't even want the, the cops to have them, you know, quite frankly. So there's some extremely controlled things, but no civilian needs to have that sort of crap in order to feel safe or have fun or, or do whatever. Any of the arguments that, you know, any of these sort of weapons can be used for hunting. I got an uncle who used to hunt deer with a pistol, but he's, he's you know, a guy who actually understands guns. He's not, you know, a, a play around kind of guy. So we're going to have this sort of stuff going on for, for a long time. And here's my sort of inflammatory statement. I confiscated them all, quite frankly. I, I, it's not going to happen, but I'm, I'm at the point where I'm, I'm fed up enough with the total inaction on this, this issue and the NRA just essentially funneling tons of money into, you know, these, these uh that's pockets um you know i i don't know what else w would be done there's going to be apparently there's going to be a national walkout day for teachers i think that's a great idea i'm going to support that um anyway back to the stoic question so how would how would the stoic handle this oh well, it's uh it's a tough situation because all you know by the time that happens law and order has broken down and and, you know, you used to respond, um, but, you know, what you ought to do is, is get yourself and whoever you're responsible for safe as quickly as you can, and then start training them. I think the coach who threw himself in front of the students um, was displaying courage. Uh, you don't have to be a stoic to do that. You get to be people who, who, who uh, uh, stress the need for that sort of thing. Courage is doing – is taking risks like that and saving children um, is is a good reason for that. So very difficult topic. Um, and I don't know that I have anything really helpful else to say about that. Um, Kanal asks, when you're done with Hegel, would you do a series? Maybe. I mean... Those, yeah, those probably would be good to do. See, here, here's something about Lacan. If you want to read Lacan and make sense out of him, don't read the Ecree at first. Read some of the seminars because the seminars make more sense. In the Ecree, Lacan, who's a brilliant guy, and I really like for a lot of reasons, is acting like a jerk. 
He's kind of sticking it to everybody, showing everybody how clever he is, you know, putting in as many references as he possibly can and plays on words. And there's really no good reason for it. I mean, people try to give, you know, good reasons for it. There isn't any good reason for that sort of thing. You know, um, his ideas are worth thinking about. That's not actually a text that I thought about giving the half hour Hegel treatment to. Um, but I could be, I could be convinced. I, I'll tell you this before I jump into any big book, I'm going to have to set up some make putting that much effort in, uh, uh, very, very, you know, worth through some other crowdfunding thing. I, I've been considering doing, you know, Heidegger's being in time starts being in nothing. This Aris metaphysics, Plato's Republic. I can only do one big book at a time. You know, I am doing some smaller ones. Like I did, you know, that whole series on Epictetus and Caridi, and Plations, going through it line by line, looking at you know the English translation, the French translation, because he didn't write in French, and the Latin. Um, so, uh, follow up question from Pancake, I think. When will he? It'll be done. Well, that's kind of good news. Before two more years, because I'm now in the uh, 500s. There's about 800 paragraphs. I'm making good progress, getting six videos done per month. Um, so, yeah, that 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 works. Um, let's see. Lee, will you ever talk about Buddhism or the Bhagavad God Gita? Maybe. You know, I, I do talk about them with some of my clients. I do preparation for the um, Indian Civil Service exam, uh, which is a big uh, component on Indian philosophy, on Western philosophy. There's an ethics component, uh, social and political philosophy component and, and these things come and I talk about, you know, Gautila's, um, you know, treaties and, and, you know, all sorts of other things as well. But I, I'm not, I don't feel myself to have the same piece in part because I, you know, I don't read Sanskrit for one thing, right? And I don't read Pali. Um, if I want to know what Hegel's puzzle it out, you know, <clears throat> you might say, well, then why the hell did you do anything on Dostoevsky? or Kierkegaard, but you don't know Danish. Well, but but I, I trust the Hong translations, and and uh, so I, I I don't I don't know if I'll if I'll do stuff on that again. That that would require me to have more time on my hands. So a lot of this, a lot of the answer to these things is you know when I reach a sufficient level of support, um, because you know I don't have uh, backing from a school. Or a governmental agency, or something like that. It's 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 viewers essentially and subscribers who wing of what I do. The other stuff that I do to earn a living, you know, the tutorials, coaching, consulting, all of that. Um, that that's that's a bit different. Um, but there are people who are like you know paying for that. So <clears throat> um, I will say this though: it's sort of religions. And so, you know, I was reading a lot of stuff, always in translation, of course. Um, and then I, I got to teach, you know, when I was teaching in the prison, uh, world religions was a staple class. So I would continually be adding more and more to it. And then I got to, I got to teach a couple of upper classes in, in uh, religious studies on Eastern religions as well, which is, you know, a lot of philosophical work as, as well. So that was fun. Uh, Ashley asks, can I recommend any ethics, critical thinking, and philosophy book for toddlers, children, and tweens? I, I, I can't because I don't read much secondary lit. I, and I don't do much of that for, for kids. Um, I'm usually just reading you know stuff that people are sending to me. Are the unnatural and unnecessary desires such as for wealth, power, good reputation, fame, <clears throat> which are, are based on groundless Opinion and Epicureanism, or empty opinion, kenos doxia, uh, synonymous to the external factors in Stoicism. I'd say uh, similar, um, but not the same. Um, 
there's different analyses being given and there's a different basis for, for how this is being uh, puzzled out. And I'd say, you know, if you want to get a good comparative like discussion, which is at times unfair to Epicureanism, but is presenting it pretty well, um, read, read on the ends. Um, do, here's a good one. Lucro, do I know any Polish philosophers? Yes. And as a matter of fact, I did an interview with Stan Kiewicz. Um, I think I butchered his name as I usually do. I always have to ask him every time I see him. He and I, he's in, he's one of the mo modern Stoicism team. Um, and so uh, uh, with him, just uh, it's an under uh, conversations that matter, I think, or ideas that matter. Um, he's a cool guy, young guy, just just had a kid, uh, does a lot of work on Stoicism there. Have I known any other uh, Polish philosophers? I've met a few here and there. Sometimes like in the Mackin uh, Association, the International so Association for Macintarian Inquiry, I think it's, yeah, it's me, International Society for Macintarian in Inquiry. Um mathematician uh when i was as one of my math teachers when i was at lakeland college she came in like the uh two years before i left and i took i took some classes with her uh and she actually had some really interesting speculations about numbers and you know um with any of the youtube discussions between people like sam harris and jordan peterson no, like I, I said at the beginning, I don't really watch a lot of other people's videos in part because I don't have time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've heard about their their discussion. People have referenced it a lot. Um, and, I, you know, I guess I should stay on top of that sort of thing because we're all kind of working in the same niche of public intellectual, but I see what I do different than what they do. So... Uh, Gunam, lately I've be begun to consider language an obstacle to knowledge. I feel myself drawn away from argumentation. What do you suggest? Um, it's always okay to take a break for a while, but you're ne never going to get away from language. Uh, probably the issue, um, you know, feeling like uh, everybody's arguments are, are kind of BS or, or you're groundless, but, you know, it's all we is logos, speech and reason. To work with, um, which doesn't preclude, by the way, the you know the emotions or affections. So, very uh, ask any views on antinatalism, pessimism, cosmic nihilism. Uh, I'm not a proponent of any of them. I, I, um, I, I, you know, I don't buy into any of them. <laughs> so, um, oh. Okay. Jonathan asked an interesting, very practical question. I save 50 to 75% of my income, hoping one day I'll have enough money to take off life. What do you and people in chat think of this? Well, that's amazing that you can even do that to begin with. Um, I've lived very, very frugally at many, and I, I actually live pretty frugally now. Um, you know, the biggest expense is, is probably living here in, in, in the middle of Milwaukee. Um, I'm, I'm a, a fan of saving, um, 75% that that's just incredible. <laughs> you, know, you actually can manage to do that and, and not, you know, break any, any, you know, ethical uh, rules as, as you want. And it, it makes sense to me, you know, um, money is, is something that, 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 useful oh don't have any of it um but you know you want to keep it in proper perspective so i i don't see anything wrong with doing that you'll probably find that you wind other things that involve other people with that money in that retreat anyway um i'm gonna skip down a bit um Derek asks, have you history on John Locke and the aftermath of the English Civil Wars? I am doing one this year. <laughs> uh, I do one ancient, one medieval, one early modern, and late modern. So this year it is uh, 
Well, we just did the Cicero, um, and then I'm doing Augustine, and then and, uh, and then we're finishing up with Albert Camus. Um, let's see. Can I ask uh, regarding say that Kant is fiction? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't. Uh, I imagine that's probably coming from the history of philosophy, which I haven't looked at for, for quite a while, because so bad in parts that it's it's not worth returning to. Um, so I don't know why he says that Kant is, is fiction, but, you know, or if he... In, um, Jonathan, any thoughts on Alan Watts? Um, I mean, a good popular faithful you know, interpretations of non-Western philosophy, but he's a lot of fun, you know. Um, I think that, you know, like a lot of people in his generation, um, it, you know, non-Western philosophy was commissioned to him, and it opened up all sorts of interesting doors. Um, but, you know, he's... Uh, yeah, he's sort of like Will Durant or Bertrand Russell in the history of Western philosophy. Um, you know, you can read them; just take it with a grain of salt. Um, what do you think is worth taking out of Hume's an inquiry concerning the principle of making any video in that text? Um, I've considered it, but you know, it, there's like considering. In the sense of like, wouldn't it be fun to do something during like, you know, getting into the planning stage? And I, I'm I'm nowhere near that. I, I did do a few things on Hume, uh, of religion. Uh, I did a video on that a long time ago. Um, so a lot of the inquiry concerning the principles of morals is actually reworked from Book Three of the the treatise um, on human nature, which is a better work, I think. Than both of the inquiries, um, in part because it's a, an attempt to be sort of systematic about about the human project. Um, I mean, what's interesting in there? You know, the discussions of justice, whether there's a social contract or not, the whole notion that um, uh, it's really you know the human uh, the, and the nature of the human being that we can rely upon. I mean, if you think about Hume, right? Hume, you've got, got like the, the you know the the uh, ways idea you know causality doesn't really exist, and you would think that Hume would be saying, um, well, anything kind of goes, but no, he says there is a human nature that we can uncover, pretty much the same everywhere. Um, if you take that out of the picture, Hume becomes way more skeptical. Than, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool. Oh, wow. Lyndon asks, what common straw man annoys you the most? Which one are you t totally sick of? That's tough. That's sort of like asking me who's my favorite philosopher, right? There's so many. <laughs> um, that, that personally annoys me. When people are like, oh, you know, uh, you academics, you don't really understand, you know, uh, how, how things work in the real world. And you're like, first off, dummy, I, 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 I'm not in traditional academia and haven't been for a long time. So nice job on doing your research you know, before you've opened your mouth. And second, um, academics live in the real world just like everybody else. Uh, we all have, you know, the same mortgages, taxes, car payments, you know, with us getting into school, you know, uh, as the, the thing is, we put our pants on one leg at a time and sometimes, you know, our foot gets caught in the pants, just like the regular people who think that somehow you're closer to reality or something like that, you know, I, I mean, that's, um, I see People do it. I mean, they're an ad hominem, right? But I see people doing that a lot, and they do it like when you've called them on their BS. Like they put forth something. I do. It happens a lot in like Stoic, the Stoic things, right? Where um, uh, somebody will put forth some really off the wall interpretation. I'll be like, listen, act opposite of that. 
um, here's the video on it. And I'll be, oh, you academics. And I'll be like, you know, <laughs> good luck with your studies. It's for, I'm not going to bother with conversation with you, you know. Uh, it's even funnier when it happens to Donald, who is, uh, uh, you know, a psychotherapist. <laughs> so uh, he's not an academic at all. Neither, actually, about, uh, I would say, a third of the people in the modern stoicism project are definitely not not academics you know some of them are you know really high level academics like chris gill um but in that you know you get involved in a discussion about something that has to do with philosophy and somebody who actually knows something about it says something to you it, it's a good thing right off so that's that's one uh for me i would i would say um oh Sammy has a great. Would you consider on the philosophy within Alice in Wonderland? I've never thought of that, but that would actually be a lot of fun. I have discussions of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and actually, you know what else would be kind of cool with that? Would be like the, the Chesterton. Um, but Alice in Wonderland, yeah, that, that could be really interesting. Again, it's a matter of finding the time to to, to do these things. So I, I don't know. I gotta. What I actually ought to sit down is do is sit down and um, like think about all the cool projects I'd like to be working and get people to to fund these these projects to make it, it possible. So here's a question: Can what does it matter and how does it help a person if they understand the difference between idealism and materialism or rationalism and empiricism or determinism and indeterminism? Um, what does anything matter? I mean, it's nice to know reality. It's nice to know what people mean by terms. Um, those are some bennies right there, I guess. Um, you know, if the Stoics are right, we have kind of an Aristotle's, right? We have kind of innate desire to presumably the distinctions that people have made could be worth knowing about. Uh, um, do you need to know those exact, um, you know, you could do Aristotle and never think about idealism and materialism because that's not how Aristotle actually coordinated his thinking about things. Um, these are, you know, these are sort of, words that we we associate things under um i guess they're useful when you're when you're starting out learning philosophy but you don't want to be too wedded to typical work is basically saying is so and so uh an indeterminist that's really kind of boring um the the interesting thing is well okay let's say so and so is an indeterminist how does it actually work what do they think the will is how does it, how do these factors impinge on it that's what i'm always more interested in um, people have asked me about a couple people here, Nick Land, Edward Reset. Um, I haven't read those, those people, so I don't know anything about them. Uh, Jessica asked, could you briefly describe the differences in the conception of nothing between Jewish Kabbalah, Buddhist cosmology, existentialism, and vulgar conception? No, I cannot briefly do that. As a matter of fact, I'm not qualified to talk about the Jewish Kabbalah, um, and uh, or to generalize about Buddhist cosmology, um, I can say that even just within existentialism, Sartre and Heidegger uh, disagree about the nature of the nothing, um, and um, about you know sort of how negation works, and and so that, you know it's, it's quite complicated. It's something eventually I do want to write a book about a book about nothing. Hashir asks, how are the limits of my language, limits of my thought? Um, well, you know, you don't have to be Wittgenstein, uh, or rather early Wittgenstein to, to think that that idea. Um, language conditions are, are ways of thinking, you know? It, it's, it's not, it may not be that the limits of our language are the limits of our thought. And, and Wittgenstein, you know, kind of backpedals on a lot of these, these, these assertions. Um, but, you know, it's pretty hard to follow a thought through without using language. And, and the language that we are working with does condition it. Um, so that's important. Um, 
Thomas asks, what are some ideas from philosophy people should know in order to live flourishing lives? Um, well, I mean, there's a whole slew of them. Um, I mean, let, let's make it really simple. You got to figure out, first of all, what, what counts as flourishing, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways of conceiving this. Some people think it's having a ton of money and, you know, buying a lot of consumer goods. And then they try it and they find out that they're not really happy because they didn't work on their character at all. And, and they, they're screwing everything up with the money that they have. Um, some people think that, you know, just indulging in physical pleasure is going to really uh, make them happy and they do that and then they get bored with it. And, um, you know, we can go on and on and on about that. But I, I would say that thinking about the nature of what, what actually counts as flourishing, that that's an important starting point, right? And then, you know, understanding um, what we mean by, say, habits, virtues, vices, that that's pretty important as well. Uh, a lot of it is be, being able to make good distinctions. <clears throat> um, well, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Seth Perry, would you ever go to the streets to question people about their beliefs kind of like Socrates did? <clears throat> so, I mean, Socrates gives you that line, but he doesn't really, like, spend a lot of time in the agora talking with people. You read Plato's dialogues. Most of them take place in houses or in, um, you know, like, like, parks or, or things like that. Um, but he did go around and ask people lots of questions. Um, he did way more than that because otherwise he would just be an insufferable ass. Um, people who are going to do Socratic questioning usually are just, you know, they're bo really boring, quite frankly, um, because you can just keep on asking why, 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 why over and over again. And that isn't all that Socrates does. Um, he actually does have some some ideas about things, and he tries to lead people into to them. Um, would I ever do that sort of thing? I don't know. I mean, if somebody gave me a show, I guess. But again, it's it's a question of time. I, I get twenty four hours a day, just like everybody else, um, spend it on that rather than on, let's say, producing content or or things like that. <clears throat> um, D fact. What do you think of living philosophers like uh, Molyneux? Um, uh, I guess I could c consider Molyneux a philosopher. So, I mean, I'm willing to say that Rand is a philosopher. Um, I, you know, I watched him early on. This was back when I was at FSU, and I was totally underimpressed with, with him. Um, and I don't really, you know, every once in a while I'll watch like a little bit of one of his videos when somebody's posted something and it's never changed my, my view. Um, there are some great living philosophers. Alistair McIntyre is still alive, you know? Um, I've been lucky enough being involved with the modern stoicism project to get to meet Chris Gill, um, to get to meet as, as Julie Annis and um, uh, Margaret Graver, and uh, at the upcoming Stoicon, I'm going to get to meet a long. These are heavyweights. These are people who have made massive contributions to understanding ancient philosophy. Um, you know, and, and getting to talk with them, uh, that's great. Um, there, there's a lot of living philosophers out there who aren't big, you could say, in the pop culture field or in the YouTube verse that are doing some really wonderful work and, and thinking. All right. Here's a question from somebody whose name is in, in uh, uh, Chinese characters, which I, I only know like 200 of them. I can't read this. Have you ever learned Chinese philosophy? Why not come to China to give a course one day? So two good questions. Yes, I, I used to teach um, Chinese philosophy, but not at an expert level. Um, I actually have made a couple stabs at learning Mandarin, um, but I never actually followed it through effectively. You know, is kind of a downer for me. Um, would I can would I come to China to give a course? Yeah, but I'd have to be invited. <laughs> so so if you if if people are interested in that, they've they've got to send me an invitation and and make all the arrangements. But yes, I'd certainly be willing to do that sort of thing. I'd, I'd love to do that. 
Um, <clears throat> same thing goes for anybody anywhere. You want me to come and give a talk? Email me. You know, I, I give talks all over the, the place. Um, you want me to come teach a course somewhere? You know, get in touch with me about that. Um, all right, we're getting kind of close to time. We'll, we'll just keep taking these. Lyndon, what are some of the important cultural components of modern America that have their seeds in religious thought or religious culture? Oh, well, you know, there was that uh, phrase uh, somebody had about the God-haunted South, but the whole, you know, of America is God-haunted, right? And we have, you know, we have like all these different denominations and, and families that have made their impact. Um, I mean, it's kind of funny even today, you know, uh, atheists complain about this pretty routinely that it'd be very hard to run as an atheist candidate uh, for, say, president. Although, you know, you look at, at, you know, quite a few of the presidents and they may as well have been atheists because whatever thin veneer of faith that they have uh, is, is, is just and, and, and had no impact whatsoever on their, their presidencies. Um, but it's very important to, to appeal to that because there's, there's a lot of people who um, take that quite, quite seriously. Um, I mean, you know, here in America, we have all these different religious institutions, and they do affect quite a lot of... Uh, aspects of our life but you know many of them are, are kind of falling down in their their religious tasks um you know i'll give you one prime example um it's really funny you know when people talk about like catholic um colleges and universities because most of them are very barely catholic and, and there's often like sort of like divisions within them like if you go to notre dame university of notre dame there's actually a guidebook for the students uh, that helps them to t get an authentically Catholic education because they will not get it going to the regular classes in the university. You got to like you know, go to this professor, this professor, this professor, avoid this one, avoid this one, because there's been so much hiring of people who are just, you know, absolutely hostile to, to any sort of orthodoxy. Um, and this is the case in, in, in many cases. I, I've been told because I do work on the Catholic intellectual tradition. This is years back when I was still on the job market. You're too Catholic to work at that Catholic institution. They'd never hire you. Um, and I'm not particularly devout. <laughs> I just happen to have written on Blondell and Aquinas and people like that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times these religious institutions, there are a lot of, you know, real beliefs within them, but a lot of times the institutions themselves are kind of doing what everybody else does, um, and they, they gussy it up with, with uh, uh, kind of a religious tinge to it, um, and that, that's all too often the case, you know. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's the sort of thing that um, you want to be attuned to, I guess. Um, zero Foefi, uh, how does Sartre deal with choices is related to the future? He says this, the future doesn't exist, but is it now? So what about choices that depend on the outcome of each other? I mean, read Being and Nothingness, and he <laughs> sets it out in great detail, or read some of his novels. Um, the future, strictly speaking, doesn't exist, but we, we make choices, and, and Sartre doesn't believe that there isn't a, it's only like the eternal now or something like that. Um, he just thinks that we're, our choices are, are dependent on the grounds that we choose for making those choices. We exist in radical freedom, as he says, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the apparatus for that, there's, there's a really good discussion of that in being in nothingness. Subconscious qualms is Marx the greatest political theorist of all time? If not, who is? Um, I don't think Marx is the greatest political theorist. Um, a lot of Marxists do, though, right? If I had to pick the greatest political theorist of all times, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, so many people sort of like rise up, but they don't have all the all the stuff that I'd want. So I, I don't know. I, I couldn't say, I guess. Um, let's see. Oh, a whole bunch of new questions here. Um, we're getting close to 
to I'll go over a little bit as I've done in the past. Um, scrolling up a lot. Uh, um, here's one from Seth Perry. You should get it. I have a Patreon to help me financially. All you have to do is like type in, you know, uh, Sadler or Patreon. You're going to find it. Uh, um, so I'm not sure how you don't see it. Um, and there's super chats. Yeah, but you, you got you to set that. I haven't done that. I've streamed debating or having a conversation with another person. That takes some doing, you know. Um, I mean, we all have things that we like, I think. I have done live streams in the past like that. Um, but I don't know that I'm going to do that at, at this point. I, I already do enough, like, podcasts. Thing, shows stuff like that. If you if you follow me on, on my you know my website or or you know other social media, you'll probably hear a lot about that stuff. Um, oh wow, there's a lot here. Um, people complaining about the connection. It's YouTube, you know. You get what you get. I know that, right? Um, Andrew's got a great question. Do you think knowledge is something that can be complete? Completely gained from books or is an interface teachers experience required I think it's the latter um, I mean some kinds of knowledge you can get from books or courses or stuff like that um, but others you you actually need you know the thing and you need some back and forth with with practitioners who can help you with it um, let's see. What did Thomas Aquinas say about the Stoics? This is from J to B to Nick. Um, well, that's interesting. So Thomas got the Stoics wrong in the Treatise on Emotions. Um, he took the Stoics as saying that all, um, and as we know, of course, that that's not the case. Um, the Stoics do view many emotional responses as you know, perturbations, I'm mangling the word, uh, of the soul, disturbances, right? And they do think those are bad, but they also thought they were the good passions or the good good emotions, the eupatheia. Um, and uh, I mean, Thomas didn't get that. Um, what does he have to say about them? I don't really Really remember any other things coming to mind, but I'm not doing a lot of work on Thomas lately. So, um, let's see. Scroll down a bit. Um, here's an interesting one. Any thoughts on Alain Badiou? Um, uh, you know, interesting guy. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at his stuff. My wife has actually studied with him um, at EGS and he acted in his play uh, there. And uh, she says he's a great guy. Um, but, he, you know, he's not somebody who I, I really have the time for spending a lot of time on, you know, uh, unfortunately, because I don't, I don't have that much. Um. Oh, here's a great one from Michael. What philosophers do you dislike now that in years past you enjoyed or agreed with? Dislike. Um, I don't know that there's any I dislike offhand. Or I, I like went through a phase, and I've done videos about that. And... Um, you know, I was like, well, I got to kind of leave this behind, right? I went through a Derrida phase. I went through through a uh, Wittgenstein phase. I went through a Nietzsche phase. Um, so you see videos and there's a thing about a phase. That's a good sign that I, I disagree with them because I'm no longer in that phase, right? Um, probably, that's probably the best way to, to answer it. Um See what else we Paul. <laughs> this is from Tim. Powerful cardigan there. Yeah. So this is the this is the dude sweater, right? Um, I, I was getting all of these uh, uh, remarks. Yeah, you know, when I used to wear my hair down, 
Uh, and my hair was a bit shorter then too. And of course, my beard wasn't wasn't gray um, on a lot of the earlier videos. And people were like, is the dude teaching philosophy? And so um, my wife got a real kick out of that. And then one Christmas, a couple of Christmases ago, she bought me this this sweater. And I've worn it in, in some places, like you know, going here in, in Milwaukee, duck pin bowling, and people are all like, ah, oh, look, the dude is bowling. So yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, what if we gave all of our yearly profits and extra labor to huge prolific projects that would ensure humankind's survival for 17,500 years? That would be pretty cool. Um, uh, I'm not at the stage where I can actually uh, devote yearly profits to anything because I'm just basically living, uh, doing what I do, and I don't have any extra labor time. I already give away a lot of stuff for free, like here, uh, or the talks that I do, or you know, I do some some pro bono work as well. But you know, would it be good for for other people to do that? Yeah, I mean, it'd be wonderful to see that sort of prescience rather than you know people just saying, "Screw it, I've got my money." Uh, as they say, devil take the hindmost. Um, <clears throat> so let's see what else we got here. Alt biz, maybe. Why do they call you the Minotaur? So that there's a little story there. The, who's who's the they there? Uh, the people on Fortune, um, and they coined the phrase the Minotaur of Milwaukee. And you'd have to ask them precisely why. I, that came up. There's there's a picture of me out there. A uh, colleague of a friend and colleague of mine recently sent me a, like a super super long screenshot of like a, a long thread <laughs> talking about the the videos. And there's one where it, it's actually from a very old video of mine that I did back at Fayetteville State University, and they put like a minotaur head on on top of my my body. I guess it's because I'm a really big guy um, and. Uh, Maybe I'm bullish in, in some some way. I don't know. Um, oh, here's a good one from Sami. Who? What, what is the school of philosophy that has influenced you the most? I guess if you had to say in general, like across the board, who's been most influential on me, it'd be Aristotle probably. But, you know, he, he would not be very far ahead of, say, the Stoics and Plato and various Christian authors and existentialists, um, all kind of neck and neck. Uh, um, it might change too as I get older. Uh, um, here's an interesting one from Canal. Why do people without any or very little formal education become so popular on YouTube in the philosophy sphere of the site, mainly thinking of Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, et cetera? Well, I mean, Jordan Peterson, so we want to be careful, right? So Jordan Peterson's degree is in psychology, but that doesn't mean that he hasn't studied philosophy. I mean, you you study philosophy probably as an undergraduate, and there's plenty of overlap between philosophy and other fields. So it'd be sort of like, you know, if we say about a historian, well, they don't have a philosophy degree, so they're not entitled to talk about philosophy. Well, to begin with, philosophy is the kind of field where we actually don't see jerks. Uh, there, there are plenty of academic jerks that way, <clears throat> but you know, a lot of philosophy actually gets done outside of philosophy departments. Um, and you know, clearly he's and, and thought quite a bit about Nietzsche. Um, so, you know, Sam Harris, I don't know that much about, um, to be able to say that way. I, the bit of stuff that I've read, I haven't been impressed with, um, but why do people, a lot of, you know, let's call it philosophical training and depth become popular on YouTube? Well, well it's because it's easy for them to get a big following with, with Molyneux, right? You just stake out a strong position uh, with not a, not a hell of a lot of nuance and just keep hammering away at that. And you're going to get a lot more viewers and subscribers than people like me who are being very careful to present things accurately. And, you know, and, well, yes, but no, that's much less dramatic. I think most most people watching stuff on 
on YouTube would love to have simple answers because that's the way it is in, in the rest of the world, right? And what we try to do is wean them away from that um, as, as best we can. I don't, I don't like to, you know, go in and, and say, well, here's the whole systematic thing. You know, when I say I'm doing a presentation at a business, I often don't even tell them the stuff that I'm doing isn't just, you know, straight management theory and is actually coming from, say, Aristotle. Um, but, you know, it's uh, you see this sort of thing all the time coming up. Um, I mean, the good thing is that down the line, um, the people who are just doing popular stuff, they're they're not going to be around for 20 years, 30 years, be reading them and referencing their works, except us careful, you know, more historically grounded people. Um, uh, Rob Nelder, I've been reading the Stoics and came across your channel via Stoicon. I like the content, but there's a huge amount of it. Any tips on where to start? I've been watching the Intro to Philosophy lectures. Well, there is a search function in YouTube. So if you want to see stuff on Aristotle, type in Sadler Aristotle, right? And that'll come up. Or, or Sadler's Stoicism. There's also playlists. So if you're interested in the Stoicism stuff, you know, you go to the Stoicism playlist. Um, now, granted, there's, you know, over 100 videos in that. But, um, you know, you, you can sort of pick through them. Um, YouTube doesn't organize stuff in, in easy to follow paths. Um, but you know, I don't know really what to tell you about that. Um, it's up to the viewer to decide what they want to, what they want to go through. I mean, if you want to organize sort of a course of self-study, I do that through my tutorial services, but that's <clears throat> something I do individually with, with clients. Um, Pyro, I asked you this yesterday and you already gave me a brief answer, but how do I best use the half hour Hegel series if my native language is German? Um, I mean, we talked about what translations, you know, to get. Um, and uh, you, you got to watch them in English because I don't, I, don't, I don't do it in German. So I, I don't really know what to tell you beyond that. Um, you know, uh, I do have some German viewers and, and, and actual Patreon supporters of it, but yeah. Uh, would you recommend to live as an Epicurean or as a Stoic? I'm actually an eclectic. Um, I, I draw on Stoicism as well as on the, you know Aristotelianism and a number of different things. I would say uh, what I would recommend is read widely in both traditions. <clears throat> and then arrive at a decision for yourself, an informed decision. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, if I had to choose Epicurean or Stoicism, but there's more than just that as options, you know. Um, here's a funny one from DFAC. Buddha versus Jesus in a knife fight, who would win? All of us. Because <laughs> they wouldn't fight. So, uh, Pullman, have you, have you done considered doing videos on Seneca's letters? Yes, that is something that I want to do. And I'll actually eventually be building online course content on that as well. But it's a matter of, again, I need to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> um, oh, this is, <clears throat> this is a great one. Stephen, to what extent was postmodernism actual and vital for throwing off certain kinds of dogma, elitism, and unquestioning sheepdom? Well, that's a loaded question if I ever saw one, right? Um, postmodernism means a lot of different things. Um, I think most people who talk about postmodernism don't have a clue about what it means. They've gotten some sort of watered-down version, uh, <clears throat> which has very little connection to what we actually talk about as postmodern. Um, postmodernism, by the way, the way the postmodernists talk about it, isn't an extension of modernism. Is it absolutely crucial and vital for throwing out certain kinds of dogma? No. Um, I mean, that's part of the modern project. The whole Enlightenment project is in part about throwing off that sort of stuff. And you should also not see uh, modernism or Enlightenment as just one thing. You know, I've got a great essay back as a graduate student called Hegel or the Second Enlightenment, right? Um, there's, there's various forms of that. So, I mean, and you don't actually need that in order to, to throw off those things. But if, if reading Nietzsche helps you with that, great. You know, um, 
All right, I'm going to skip down a bit and start getting close to wrapping this up. Um, mm. Here's a good one from ACE. Do you believe ambition is more of a destructive trait or something to embrace? Both. It's more of a destructive trait, uh, the way most people seem to handle ambition. But it is also something that we ought to... Um, but embrace rightly, which means developing a proper understanding of ambition, making sense of it within uh, an ethical framework. So there's limits on it. There's, there's lines we're not going to cross. Same thing goes with, you know, self-promotion. Um, there was an interesting discussion along shameless self-promotion and whether academics ought to engage in it. And my answer was, let's use Aristotle to understand this. Um, a good one from Flea Bitten. Do you think Heidegger was right when he said we've reached the end of philosophy? No, I don't think so. Um, that said, I think that we ought to spend a lot more time, you know, engaging with past philosophy, and each generation has to sort of rediscover it anew and uh, reinterpret it. Um, but I think there's there's you know there's advances. There's 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 newer stuff. Um, so anti writes was Derrida an antichrist seems that's a common western stance i think that would be rating Derrida far to make him into an antichrist maybe you mean anti-christian or something like that and the answer would be no they're actually like working at different different direct a lot of Derrida's late work by the way you're going to see religion playing a very important role in that he even like discusses, you know, Kierkegaard and the Gospels and the gift of death, right? Um, so, no. And and Derrida, I think Derrida is one of these thinkers who you now probably only going to be read by specialists. Um, I, I I don't think he's going to have a lot of staying power. I think Foucault will have more, but even Foucault. You know, in many respects, we're going to say, well, he was wrong about this. He's wrong about this. This is an interesting idea. But this, this is underdeveloped or or this is, you know, this is too schematic, you know. Um, let's see here. Oh, drowning in decimals. What is your favorite approach in the, to the classroom? So... I like the classroom to be integrated with what we call a course management. And I, I teach, you know, online from Marist occasionally. Um, and I used to teach face-to-face -face for them as well. Um, I build out a course site. And actually, you can access some of these on the Reason IO Academy. Um, you know, I, I, I offer them, <clears throat> very few of them for free, some of them for, for, you know, very affordable prices compared to what you normally pay for college classes at, at institutions. Um, but I like to generate like an entire thing that has, you know, um, lesson pages, handouts, worksheets, lecture videos, you know, uh, if, I, if it's an online, if it's a, um, you know, a four credit class, you know, assignments, rubrics, all, all these sorts of th things. And so the idea is what you're doing in the classroom is just an extension of what you're doing in the course site. And, um, you know, I, I would also video record my, my lectures too. I mean, these are ones from Marist. Uh, and then they're resources for, for people. And so the idea is to get students to spend, instead of just spending two and a half hours in the classroom and that's the week, if I can get them like maybe 10 hours a week, a lot more learning takes place and it sticks with them a lot longer so yeah um oh it's jumped down a, a whole bunch again so it looks like a lot of have come in um do, do, do. Oh, here's a good one nicholas mccall is it just me or is aristotle more relevant to contemporary philosophy than plato mcintyre and others all seem to prefer him it is you um, McIntyre himself says that Plato is very important, um, and and there is a whole Platonic tradition. Plato doesn't end with Plato. Plato continues on through Middle Platonism, like Plutarch, 
who doesn't just write biographies, he writes all these moral treatises, and then into Neoplatonism, which then you know influences Christianity. McIntyre is more of an Aristotelian than a Platonist, but he does think that is incredibly important. <clears throat> so you know you can, say, you can say similar things about say Julianus, right? Um, so that that's a good one. Uh, boop, boop, boop. What else we got here? Um, Merrill Wolf, why should we take Bertrand Russell with a grain of salt? Well, you, you don't have to. Um, but if you read Russell and his history of philosophy and then read the people who he's talking about, you'll see that he's a pretty poor historian of philosophy misrepresenting things. So, you know, like anybody who <clears throat> tends to misrepresent things, should you take them at their word? I don't know. If you have a girlfriend who misrepresents people to you, should you believe them when they talk about that sort of thing? Probably not, right? So, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. Uh, are you aware of the philosophical school of traditionalism that is thinkers like René Guénon, Merquet, Eliad, Julius Savola? I'm aware of the, the start off the bat. I'm aware of the original school of traditionalism, the traditional traditionalists, who would be the people coming you know, out of critique of the in the in the 19th century, like uh, Joseph de Maist and uh, de Bonald and Lamennais. Um, that's what traditionalism originally meant. So already we've got a traditionalism that's not quite as traditional, right? Um, and and Eliad knows some of these people, by the way. Um, I've taught Eliad in, in, in classes. Um, I don't teach him as a traditionalist, but I, I teach him as a decent, you know, uh, phenomenologist and theorist about religion. Um, and yeah, I'm aware of the philosophical school of it. I haven't spent much time reading the other the other people involved in it, um, and I don't, I don't know if I will that. Um, but, you know, they're they're interesting. So, um, oh, here's a good one, and I know that that there's 4chan people who are who are uh, uh, listening to this. What is from? I am viewing your videos. What do you think of 4chan? So, um, you know, it's it's an interesting site, uh, you know, it's sort of like Reddit. I don't know enough about it to make it actually usable for me, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't really have the time to, to to scan it. But I have people who send shots from it every so often, and every once in a while, I'll, I'll like Google Sandler 4chan to see if some some, you know, particularly crazy stuff came up. And it, and it's interesting because um, there's such a free flow of conversation there, um, and. and People, you know, like post uh, uh, of me and and come up with uh, stories. So there, there's a lot of interesting imaginative work going on there. But it's one of those sort of things where um, I, I guess I, I I don't really get it. And I'm not saying that 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 reduces its value. Again, like like Reddit, I don't really get Reddit. You know, I, I stick to the stuff that I understand better because, again, I only have so much time. So yeah. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm glad that, that they're interested in, in my work. They usually say nice things about my stuff. Some of them, you know, get, get on me for being fat or being old or, or various other things, you know, um, but you're always going to have people criticizing you for different stuff. Um, all right. Uh, here's a good question from Rayanne. Uh, what do you think is the best way to approach the works of Aristotle? I've ever read, I've already read quite a few philosophers, but he seems a lot. <clears throat> There's no easy entry book into Aristotle, you know? It's like with Stoicism, you could start somebody off with a few of Seneca's letters and the Epictetus and <clears throat> Marcus Aurelius's meditations. <clears throat> Sorry there. Um, or like Plato, you know, let's start some of the earlier dialogues, right? And then we're not going to do the Republic right away. There is no like easy book by Aristotle. Um, a lot of people start people off with the categories. That's what Aristotle. And I, you know, already by chapter two, I was like, what the hell is this crap? I don't understand what the hell he's talking about. I'm actually developing an online class, which should be, I should be releasing later this month um, on Aristotle. 
Aristotle's categories, um, trying to help people out with that because it is so confusing. Um, I mean, here's, here's what I would say. Read Aristotle. Like, read the Nicomachean Ethics. Read the politics. Read the rhetoric. You know, read, read the works that they call the Organon. Uh, as far as... Um, you know, read the metaphysics, read the on the soul, but but each time that you approach it, don't expect to get a hell of a lot out of it. And as time goes on, you'll start to kind of see how the picture fits together. To if you don't have Greek, because there's a lot of times where like one term. This is how I got so interested in Aristotle on anger one term may be used in one way in one translation and then the same term is used uh, to mean something different in another translation it's the same term but if you don't see the greek it's hard to it's hard to that so um oh I'll, I'll mention too i've got a ton of videos on aristotle's nicomachean ethics and on the categories um do, do, do. a lot of people arguing back and forth about alistair Crowley I used to have a student who was always trying to get, you know, uh, uh, push him on me when I was in the prison. Uh, it was really big on that. Um, ba, ba, ba. Uh, let's see what we got. Um, anonymous. I have found Plato's opinions in Plato's Republic to be an argue for an authoritarianism. Have I misread Plato's Republic? Yeah, to some degree. Um, remember, the Republic is an ideal city that's being sketched out. It's not Plato's only blueprint. Um, you might want to go and look at the laws uh, as another uh, sort of counterpoint to that. Um, and you could, you know, there's authoritar authoritarianism and authoritarianism, right? It's not always the same. Um, there is a class structure with kind of a a purpose to that. It's not just, well, these guys happen to have power, so everyone should listen to them. Plato disposes of that in book one with Thrasymachus, right? The might makes right theory. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I, you probably want to go back to it and, and read it again. Um, Robert Parker, different philosophers have had different ideas of how to respond to the absurd. When one confronts the absurd, what do you believe is the best approach to bad faith or philosophical suicide um so you know this is this is one of those things where um ideas evolve if you look at what what's going on in uh myth pacificus and then later writings like letters to a german friend you know uh, uh the rebel or you know other other things along those lines or the characters in his later later um uh novels there's a lot of other possible uh reactions to to the absurd and, and new issues that that arise <clears throat> um maybe it's a mistake to generalize as much as Camus did in the myth of Syphysis about the absurd uh you know uh, simone de beauvoir said it's not an absurd life it's an ambiguous one gabriel marcel said well, a lot of things are absurd, but there's all to logical mystery. So it's not something that you uh, you necessarily want to take as as uh, absolutely given. And even Camus presents it as, well, this is how I see it, you know. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> why is Hume shaped like a potato? Because um, he ate a lot. He got fat, you know. Um, oh, here's a good one from, from random guy. We're going to, uh, an, a half an hour beyond, uh, the hour that I scheduled for this are self-help books, discount philosophy. Some are the better one. Uh, actually the better self-help books are philosophy put into a popular framework. Um, the worst ones are not even close to the level of philosophy. They're just drivel. You know, the same thing about management theory, ed theory. A lot of that's watered down philosophy of one form or another. 
So, um, whoop, what happened here? Uh, let's see here. Um, Lorenzo asks, did I start with the Greeks? No, I started in a totally haphazard way of just kind of reading stuff. And I didn't just read stuff that was philosophy. I was an avid reader when I was, when I was a kid, you know, and, and that continued on. And when I took philosophy classes, they were usually not very good. Uh, when I was in, in uh, undergraduate, even graduate school, a lot of them were not particularly great. And I just read and read and read. I did not start in any sort of sequential way. I read who I felt like reading. A lot of times, you know, who I wanted to read, I would look at the people who read them, and if I thought that person was a jerk, I wouldn't bother to read that person uh, that was being recommended. If I thought the person had something on the ball, I'd, I'd take a look at it. Um, I don't recommend that. As, I don't recommend that as a, a uh, way of doing things. Um, people always ask me, who should I start with? I always say, start with Plato, you know. Um, but you can start philosophy wherever you want. You just might find it less productive to like try to begin, you know, in the, in the 20th century. But you know, one of the things to remember is you're never going to read everybody, so you got to pick what you're going to to focus on. Um, pick one last question to end with, um, and. And uh, a lot of questions here that I'm not getting to. So I apologize for not getting to everybody's questions, but, you know, the longer that I do this, the more questions are, are piling up. Um, and, uh, oh, here's a good one. Matthias, what do you think of the problem of evil? I think that it's it's a really important thing to try to come to terms with, but it, it, it's important to try to do it in a sort of good faith, not dismissing things because you've got sort of an emotional attachment to this or this or, you know, way. And you want to read what people have read about it throughout the course of, of history because there's a lot of smart people who've said some really interesting things about that. Um, I will say this, that I, I think that Gabriel Marcel is right that the problem of evil is in some respect misnamed as the problem of evil, and it's really the mystery of evil, something that we need to adopt a different frame of reference towards. Um, and if you want to you know, uh, learn about that, um, get his uh, little book, The Philosophy of Existentialism, which uh, it, it's out of fine used copies online very cheaply, and it's also in a lot of used bookstores. <clears throat> well worth reading, you know, um, that's it for today. We're already at 132. I have another thing I got to do at two o'clock and I've got some other work I've got to get to pretty soon. Thanks for all of your really great questions. Um, uh, anybody who decides that they want to uh, support this kind of work, you can go to uh, patreon.com. That's where my Patreon is. If you, if you sign up for that, thanks very much. Those of you on here who are Patreon supporters, you guys are really helping me out with this sort of thing. Um, and uh, we'll do one of these every month uh, going forward. Um, you can see the old ones. There's, I think they're in one of my playlists. Uh, and I did a blog entry about it recently. That's pretty much it. Uh, have a great, for those of you on this continent, have a great afternoon or end of the morning if you're really far, far west. Those of you in, in your Europe and Africa and, uh, you know, the Middle East. Uh, have a great evening or nighttime. Those of you in, you know, much further uh, east in Australia, Japan, places like that, have a great morning. No, not yet. Have a great, great middle of the night next day. And, and yeah, we'll uh, call it a, a, to an end right here.